And now WHDH Radio News and Public Affairs Department present the Harvard Law School Forum, transcribed for broadcast at this time. Tonight we bring you some of the highlights from the discussion on the first hundred days of the Kennedy administration. Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona is the principal speaker. Those on the panel include Harold J. Berman, Professor of Law, Seymour E. Harris, the Tower Professor of Political Economy, and Mark DeWolf Howe, Professor of Law. And now here's tonight's moderator, Robert Brockauer, Professor of Law at Harvard. We now have three brief commentators on Senator Gold Goldwater's remarks, after which we will uh, open this up to audience participation. Our first commentator is well known to the members of the law school family, but some of you may not be familiar with him. Uh, Professor Mark DeWolf Howe began as a director of motion pictures before he took the veil. <laughs> now he is, our, he is a legal historian and an expert on the constitutional structure of the United States of America. Incidentally, he is a Democrat. <laughs> and he has been a Democrat steadfastly, even when even he knew that it was hard going. <laughs> Welcome, Senator Goldwater, ladies and gentlemen. I may do a little cheating tonight because I wasn't quite sure what my role was, but probably you didn't either, so if I do cheat, you may not catch me uh, in my sin. I take it we were meant to comment on Senator Goldwater's remarks. I thought before I heard the remarks that undoubtedly they would have been exactly the same had the recent election come out differently. I say this because I have, in the way that all of us do, certainly with no more care, but I think with the care that people who read newspapers uh, observe, I've tried to follow the positions that he's been taking in recent years, and it is to me very difficult to see a difference between his protests against Republican uh, liberalism, or what might be called conventional Republican conservatism, and the <laughs> and the program of the Democratic Party. I feel quite confident that he would have found the same faltering and tentative, ineffective program if it had been introduced by uh, Nixon, as he seems to find in the faltering ineffectiveness of Senator Kennedy in his program uh, to centralize all power uh, in the national government. <laughs> now, if I might, I have only a very few minutes, I understand, under the uh, ground rules here. If I might, I'd like to speak semantically for a moment because I think uh, the Senator's statement of his position forces us to define our terms. He has spoken of himself not only tonight but on other occasions as uh, a conservative. And in his book, at least, and I think the same position has been taken uh, in all his utterances, he seems to think that the position that he pronounces with respect to the uh, nature of governmental power and the responsibilities of our government, national and state, is a conservative position, and that he is the true conservative, and that it is the conscience of a conservative that he represents. Well, in the first place, I find it very hard if what I first said is true, that he would have had the same reluctance to accept a program offered by President Eisenhower or Nixon as conservatism, to accept his classification of himself as a conservative. And I honestly believe that if we are to talk with any accuracy in political language, it is only fair for one who has criticized not only the positions of the Democratic Party, 
but the positions of the uh, spokesman for the Republican Party, that the possession of Senator Goldwater be described for what it is. There's nothing shameful about it, but it is, in my judgment, a reactionary position. <laughs> I suspect that those of you who have, who have read his book on the conscience of a conservative will have been as much impressed as I was by his conception <laughs> by his conception or I might say his misconception of the nature of our constitutional government as I understand <laughs> as I understand the senator's position he finds a single reading in the constitution an 18th century reading inflexible immovable and final he asks that the court and the government interpret this constitution as it seemed to those persons who wrote it with whom he happens to agree <laughs> he has on several occasions certainly in that book he indicates uh, suggested that it is a total distortion of constitutional power for the supreme court of the united states to concern itself with problems of education because the federal government has no granted authority with respect to education. He has suggested this evening that there is a distortion of the national power under the Commerce Clause, and that, in fact, we abuse our power when we deal by national authority with things that seem to him to be local. Now, what I would ask him is whether he would classify John Marshall as a conservative. I take it if he is really fair with his conscience, he would not. Because surely John Marshall told us that this Constitution about which the Senator speaks so eloquently is something that has growing vitality to it, that it is, as he insisted, a Constitution that we are expounding, and not a corporate charter. What we are working with is a frame of government designed to work in another world than that in which it was written, and which must be adapted to serve the needs of a new society. Would, I wonder, Senator Goldwater describe Chief Justice Hughes as a conservative? Chief Justice Hughes said, we should be faithless to our supreme obligation if we interpreted the great generalities of the Constitution so as to forbid flexibility in making adaptations to meet new conditions and to prevent the correction of abuses incident to the complexity of our life or as crystallizing our own notions of policy, our personal views of economics, and our theories of moral or social improvement. He also warned us of the folly of insisting that what the provisions of the Constitution meant to the vision of that day, they must mean to the vision of our time. Now, it seems to me that in what Senator Goldwater has written, if not explicitly in what he has said this evening, he is repudiating the positions of Chief Justice Hughes. And I should have supposed that Hughes was a conservative. As I've suggested, the Senator has indicated on other occasions that education is not a matter of national concern. I wonder if he would call Chief Justice Taft a conservative. <laughs> on that issue, Taft said, speaking of federal aid to education, it is so great a work that the agency of the national government must be invoked to help in some practical and unobtrusive, un unobstructing way. Why may we not have the standard of educational thoroughness improved in the common school system by federal activity, even though the nation has no direct authority in political, uh, in matters of education. Now, if these are the pronouncements of conservatives, and it seems to me they are the classic pronouncements of conservatives, I ask Senator Goldwater whether he is fair to us and fair to his own conscience when he describes himself as a conservative. Thank you. next commentator, Professor Harold Berman of the Harvard Law School, is a Yale. <laughs> he is also our Russian expert, and he carries briefly with us before he departs to 
uh, renew the franchise in Leningrad. I think it is fair to make full disclosure that he is also a self-styled conservative. He calls himself an independent voter. There are others of us who use a different term. <laughs> we call it undeclared voter. What it means is somebody who is registered to vote but who does not vote in primary elections. <laughs> Professor Berman. I know I shouldn't have talked to Mr. Brocker before the this, this dinner this evening. Senator Goldwater, Mr. Brocker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm equally puzzled uh, with Mr. Brocker as to why uh, I should be here, as he called me an independent voter. Uh, I think that Mr. Howe uh, solved the problem when he characterized Senator Goldwater's uh, position as equally anti-democratic and anti-republican. Uh, I think that probably is my position. It's sort of an academic uh, position, which one can more easily take, I suppose, uh, here in Cambridge uh, than in Washington. <laughs> But I find myself uh, concerned with the implications of Senator Goldwater's conservatism, and I think his book, The Conscience of a Conservative, is well worth reading. It's, it seems to me a challenge to the dogmatic liberalism, uh, which, of which we've had a great deal. Uh, I, I find myself concerned with the implications of conservatism uh, for our foreign policy. And I was asked to address myself to that question, I suppose by the chairman, before he knew that Senator Goldwater was not going to speak about foreign policy tonight. However, Senator Goldwater did say that the terms apply, the terms liberal and conservative apply equally to foreign policy as to domestic. Uh, and this has concerned me very much because if one looks at the two parties, uh, one finds very little difference between them, though one finds differences within each. Uh, with respect to foreign policy over the years. And it's very hard to know what is a liberal foreign policy and what is a conservative. And I looked at Senator Goldwater's book in the hope that it might offer uh, some enlightenment on that question. I'm very sorry for that reason that he didn't choose to talk about it tonight, though he said he would be open to questions about it. I must say that I found myself in agreement with many of his definitions of conservatism but I found them not borne out in his book uh, by his treatment of our foreign policy, nor do I find the conservatism, as he defines it, of our American tradition uh, borne out in President Kennedy's handling of the Cuban situation, which he spoke of tonight uh, with admiration. It would seem to me that his position with respect to conservatism at home is that we stand on the principle of a limited government, that there are some things the federal government must not do because the Constitution forbids the federal government to do them. And even though the people need certain things to be done, nevertheless, the federal government ought not to do them because the people need a limited federal government, because the alternative to a limited federal government is ultimately a welfare state which has implications of a totalitarian nature. Now, I suppose one can, one can stop short uh, of those implications. But this is his general thesis with respect to uh, a conservative domestic policy. It's a policy based fundamentally on a constitutional principle, upon law and upon historical development, as he mentioned briefly uh, tonight, upon gradual change and upon the establishment of certain principles of order which are superior to the immediate needs, at least, uh, of the moment and which condition them. Now, I would, I would urge that this is exactly what's needed uh, in international relations today, the establishment of what you might call constitutional principles or principles of international order. And here, in reading Senator Goldwater's book, I was dismayed to see a reference to 
the legitimate functions of government uh, as including maintaining internal order, keeping foreign foes at bay. Is that the signal for the riot? <laughs> the list of legitimate functions of government were maintaining internal order, keeping foreign foes at bay, administering justice, removing obstacles to the free interchange of goods. And as I say, I was dismayed because I would think that one of the legitimate functions of government is not only keeping foreign foes at bay, but from the beginning of our national development, and I think Senator Goldwater may agree that this was an oversight in giving his list, which didn't pretend to be complete, not only keeping foreign foes at bay, but establishing positive legal relationships, uh, rela negotiating and establishing relationships in the international order which will establish international stability. This has been a historic and age-old task of government. It's perhaps the most acute and crucial task of our government today. And so I would say that Senator Kennedy, President Kennedy, uh, in his inaugural address, uh, stressing the necessity for negotiation with the Russians, stressing that there are areas in which, to our mutual advantage, we can establish agreement, that there are certain problems which unite us, as he put it, on which we can, though it will require enormous patience, and we shouldn't be over-optimistic, uh, nevertheless, in the course of time, establish uh, rules and a framework. Uh, I'm, I would think that this was essentially a conservative position, uh, as defined by Senator Goldwater. Uh, I'd like to make one other point uh, before returning just very briefly to the one I just made. Uh, there's a very great paradox in the position uh, which stresses individual freedom, uh, limited government, uh, free enterprise, states' rights, uh, local initiative at home on the one hand and which stresses, as Senator Goldwater does in his writings and in his book when he comes to foreign policy, the necessity of the United States to arm, uh, to fight uh, the Cold War to a victory, uh, and to mobilize itself uh, for a struggle uh, which is the greatest struggle that we have ever faced. The paradox is obvious. Uh, if we are to have such mobilization, or semi-mobilization, and if we are to assume that negotiation with communist governments is impossible, uh, then, of course, we must have enormous centralization of federal control, leading even to the kind of proposal that Senator Kennedy, that President Kennedy, excuse me, made uh, yesterday, that the press should accept certain curbs uh, upon its, its uh, functions, its activities uh, in reporting governmental affairs. I speak of this as a paradox. I think this is one question I'd like to put to him. How can he reconcile uh, the increase that he asked for in private initiative and individual liberty uh, in our domestic affairs with the uh, militant, and I think that's fair, a fair word, the militant uh, uh, mobilization of our strength, uh, which he asks for uh, in foreign affairs. Uh, but to come back finally and, and to close, uh, uh, I think that the, the problem of establishing an international legal order in which we can coexist, if you like, to use that word, cooperate, in which we can establish areas of free initiative throughout the world uh, with our enemies included, is essentially a problem which can only be solved through uh, the kind of legality, the kind of constitutionalism, uh, which I style uh, essentially conservative in its nature. Thank you. Uh, Senator Goldwater, my question to you, sir, is with regard to certain issues of political philosophy which have become somewhat prominent in the current debate between uh, conservatives and liberals. Specifically, I am interested in the proposition urged by many of your admirers 
the effect that the greatest of our troubles stem from the relativism and pragmatism uh, which, it is said, pervade and poison the liberal position. Conservatives, on the other hand, are said to be moved only uh, by principle and by reference to absolute values. Now, I wonder, sir, whether you might enlighten us uh, as to the relevancy of uh, these propositions to your recent article entitled A Foreign Policy for Americans, in which you suggested that apartheid in South Africa, although not a good thing, uh, is probably to be maintained because of its Cold War value, and that while... I think we've got about enough questions And that for while one. an independent Algeria... <laughs> and that while an independent Algeria might be a good idea, uh, because of Cold War necessities, we shouldn't uh, go too far on that. Well, I ought to demand equal time. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's possible to answer the entire question simply, so I'd merely start out by saying that if I felt that the so-called liberal movement were a true liberal movement, uh, I wouldn't apply that reasoning to it, but I don't think it is a true liberal movement. Now, in relation to Africa, I think I said in that article that the, uh, the communist is not interested in what he accomplishes in the Congo or in other African places. His end, his end uh, target is the United States, the Western powers. And it was for that reason that I placed more importance upon the recognition of the ultimate danger to us than the present uh, danger to the countries that the Russians might infiltrate uh, in Africa. That's something that we have failed to recognize, I might suggest, down through the years of our association with our enemy, that uh, she's a very determined enemy, uh, time has no particular value to her, and that she makes these moves calculated. Uh, if they succeed, fine. If they don't, she'll come back and try again. But the end result is the destruction of the uh, economic and military power of the Western powers, particularly the United States. Next question. Professor Howe. Uh, all constitutional considerations aside, what evidence do you have, sir, that the states are not adequately caring for the educational needs of the country? Perhaps Senator Goldwater has some evidence on this, too. Well, I can't purport to be an expert on the needs of our educational system. It seems to me that when we read the papers and when we uh, hear the testimony of persons who do have information about the condition of our public school system, that there is a very vast body of informed opinion that tells us that the needs, both physically and otherwise, for improvements in our educational system are very grave. Now, I cannot purport to be an expert on this, but I am taking the testimony of people in whom I believe who say that the needs are very great, and it does seem to me quite clear that in many parts of our country, the local resources uh, of a financial sort are not sufficient to meet these needs. So that I am taking the word of others, but they, they seem, the word seems to me the word of reliable people. The uh, Senate Committee on Labor and Public Welfare used to be the Senate Committee on Education and Labor, and it still has the education function. Uh, Senator Goldwater, do you want to add to that? Uh, yes. In fact, we're going to start writing up the federal aid to education bill uh, next Tuesday morning. Now, I might say there's two, pro two parts to this problem as I see it, and I've sat for nine years listening to the testimony of the top educators in this country, and they're practically unanimous on this. Uh, it's a matter of quality that is reaching the college level, uh, not a matter of quantity. Uh, there is a problem of school construction uh, that informs the other side of it. My own f feeling is that the quality is the more important of the two problems. Now, to tell you why I divert my, uh, uh, my attention from school construction to this other problem, I think there's every evidence to show that the states are adequately taking care of this. I would be the first to agree that not every state can t finds every school district in good shape, but every state has the ability 
to take care of these poor districts. I'm making a study now on the uh, ad valorem taxes and real estate values of the entire United States. And I find some rather surprising and shocking discrepancies between the valuations placed on land and property in the South, for example, as compared to the fast-growing West or the Northeast. Uh, if the states refuse to tackle this problem, I see no reason for the federal government to move in. Now, the Senator, uh, President Kennedy tells us that we have to build 70,000 classrooms a year. I mean, pardon me, 60,000 classrooms a year. That's what his program calls for. Yet we've been building at the rate of 70,000 classrooms, and there's no indication that there will be a diminution of this. In the last 10 years, we had an increase in, in school population of 44%. In the next 10 years, it's estimated this will be in the nature of 20%. In other words, we've gone over the hump uh, of the war baby problem. We've been spending an increasing amount of money from the local level on, this, on the schools uh, for the last 10 years. We've, this last, in 59 is the last year we have figures for it. It was in excess of $16 billion. Now, if there is a problem in education, and it's only of the nature of $1.3 billion, such as the president has suggested be spent each year, then uh, I don't uh, think that's a problem that we can't surmount. I might say in closing that I have a solution to this. I can do a little politicking, can't I? I've introduced a bill that uh, would give up to $100 tax credit for money spent for school taxes, etc. Now, this would be in addition to the deduction that is already allowed, which produces about three and a half billion, not produces, it allows that much to stay home. My approach would allow another three and a quarter billion to stay home. Well, you say, how do you know it's going to be spent for education? We don't. In my hometown, we don't need schools right now, but we sure need a new sewer system, and we could tax them for that. <laughs> so I, I have never been convinced that the problem is one that can't be met at the local level. I'll go this far with the federal government, and I think it was your own Professor Conant that first I first heard suggest this, although I won't state it as an absolute fact. It's been a number of years ago. The federal government, in consultation with the top educational systems of our country, I think could provide some kind of a yardstick uh, by which you could judge the educational requirements or attainments of a student coming out of high school, the states would not be forced to use these. If they could use them, they could improve them, or they could lessen them, but it would be a standard uh, arrived at by the cooperation of the government and top educators all over the country. I think this could do a lot towards improving the quality that uh, I felt from the hearings we must look forward to. Next question. Uh, to Senator Goldwater. Uh, in your book, you have suggested that United States foreign policy ought to include the withdrawal of recognition of Russia. I wonder if you still hold this view, and if you do, uh, what uh, desirable results would accrue to the United States if we withdrew recognition from Russia? Well, you've got a good question, and it's always asked. Uh, I'll have to admit at the outset that uh, I'm a very small minority in this feeling. I never felt we should have recognized Russia in the first place when we did in 1934. <laughs> if I felt that uh, we had gained any advantage uh, over the years in that recognition, uh, such as knowledge of what's going on in the country, uh, I would hesitate to make uh, such a recommendation. But we haven't gained anything of particular importance. We took the U-2 flights to really find out what they were doing. Now, the reason I suggested this is a one of a psychological reaction, I would hope, that we having pursued this foreign policy of playing from weakness rather than strength and having lost friends by it and seeing the neutral nations develop instead of nations coming to our side, it would be my thinking that an action like this would indicate to the Russians that we intend to have victory in the Cold War, and I think it would attract countries to our side. I could be completely wrong. This is a conclusion that I reached. This, this is a conclusion that I reached after maybe I've read too much history and too much military history, but it, the, the country that plays with strength 
is a country historically that's been sat that, that has been successful in foreign policy. Uh, to Senator Goldwater. As a method of defining your conservatism, uh, the label that you give yourself as conservative in relation to Professor's How, Professor Howe's definition you as a reactionary, uh, if you were in the position of president, which is a position you suggested it is necessary for one to put himself in to gain a proper perspective, would you work actively for the repeal of all laws passed by Congress under overexpanded constitutional interpretations and by in executive inactivity in enforcement hold all action of such laws on the books at present? Well, you, you ought to be a little bit more specific than you were. Uh, I'd try to guess what you're getting at. I would not try to repeal Social Security. I would not try to repeal uh, unemployment compensation. Uh, let's see if we can think of anything that you might consider as being unconstitutional. Do you have anything in mind? I don't think Social Security, uh, if I understand the Constitution, is uh, is unconstitutional. We we can uh, we can give pe money back to the people that we've taken from them. I don't. I'll say frankly, I don't think that it's uh, I don't think that it's uh, was a was a particularly wise move in the form that it passed. And I think that the the Social Security recipient in about ten years uh, will find that he can buy better security on the outside than he can buy from his government. Oh, uh, as to the uh, suspending the operations of laws, you can't do that. Uh, the president uh, might refuse to do it. He might refuse to take what actions are his under legislation in the, in the executive branch. But these laws are not administered uh, directly by the president. There are bureaus set up to handle them. So unless you could be a little more specific, I, I don't think I can give you a better answer than that. I don't think it's a good answer, but it's the best I can do with your question. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, this is addressed to Professor Howe. Uh, we conservatives, Professor Howe, are called many names, and probably one of the grayest is reactionary. Uh, I was never quite sure what this meant, uh, except that we were left with a lot of ink thrown at, at us after it was delivered. But in the etymological sense, I think that... Uh, from Harvard yet? In the etymological sense, I think it has a certain meaning. My question is that uh, reactions are part of human nature, and that that if it is the reaction of people to fight against the lessening of their freedom, then don't you agree that it's a damn good reaction? I suddenly realized when I raised this issue of semantics that it was uh, going to rub some people the wrong way. Uh, I'd still persist in my contention that if we are going to continue to use these words, which perhaps we should cease using, it would be, I think, a fairer classification of the position which the senator takes to describe it by some other name than reactionary. In fact, it seems to me that in the American usage, the positions that uh, President Eisenhower in general has taken, the position which uh, Senator Nixon took in the campaign, the position of the Republican Party on the whole throughout the country can fairly and is usually described as the conservative position. My point is that over a great many years, Senator Goldwater has opposed that with considerable force, considerable vigor, and considerable honor, I think. The only point at which I disagree with him in his, in his, his insistence that he can fairly claim the name of a conviction which other people have used and which the American people accepts as suitable for them rather than for him. Uh, I might just comment on that. I wish what the professor said were true, because the Republican Party, I'm having a terrible time getting them to call themselves conservatives. You see, they're afraid of that word for some reason, and they want to call themselves liberals or middle-of-the-roaders or moderns or progressives. Uh, if I agree with the professor that it has been certainly the more conservative of the two parties, 
Uh, it's in the area of the welfare state that I get in my most violent arguments with my Republican colleagues. Uh, most others we pretty generally agree. But uh, I wish, Professor, you could tell me how I could get uh, Republicans to call themselves conservative when everybody else in the United States calls them conservative. Another question? Mr. Goldwater from the southern state, uh, uh, you mentioned <laughs> that we were losing our markets abroad for our cotton. Yeah. And from a uh, son of a cotton grower, I'm very interested in this. And remember the YEF, the Young Americans for Feudalism, the National. <laughs> Uh, after making a rather detailed survey of this, I find that we would have to do this by alienating uh, India and certain other people abroad if we uh, expanded our present production further than Public Law Number 480 uh, lets us. And would you please uh, say how we could go further in lowering the price of world cotton than we have done under Public Law 480, whereby we sell cotton at the world market price and we are driving the world market price down today and losing India and other allies. Thank you, Mr. Well, I'll be glad to tell you. <laughs> you just stand still. <laughs> I think that if the agricultural laws uh, under which cotton comes were changed, that the production of cotton would move from the south, where it's a very, very high-priced crop, out to the west and the southwest, where we can, we can compete. <laughs> now, let me give you the other side of that coin so that nobody's going to get hurt. The south can raise cattle a lot better than the far west. It takes one section of land to, to raise a cow in Arizona. I've seen 10 to 12 white-faced Herefords in an, on an acre of grass in the deep south. So my answer to you, sir, is let's allow this thing to work in a free way so that the adjustments can be made so that we can, with our production of four bales to the acre, supply the cotton in competition with world markets, and you, with your ten cows to the acre, can supply the United States and other markets with the meat. What about India and Egypt? Well, uh, Egypt grows long staple cotton, and so does my state. We're the only state that grows it. Uh, we, can, uh, we can produce competitively with Egypt. It's difficult, but we can do it. But the treaties with Egypt forget to prevent that. We now own 400,000 some odd bales of surplus uh, uh, long staple cotton. And our men out there, our cotton men in the long staple business, would like to get the government off their necks. In fact, we've gotten them down to 75% parity, which is below cost. And by advertising, we are promoting the famous Pima shirt and Pima cotton. If you haven't tried one, try it. You can't wear it. <laughs> Mr. Uh, I, I regret to say that Senator Goldwater has to catch an airplane, and I think I'm going to have to cut this off after two more questions. I, I'm sorry about this, but time passes. Senator Goldwater, as uh, one Republican to another, I'm a little bit confused about two CIA operations and uh, one... Uh, set of comments uh, that were made about a year ago. Uh, basically, the question boils down, boils down to this. Uh, why, uh, comparing the U-2 flights over Russia, which was successful over a number of years, with the recent operation in Cuba, has no Republican senator the courage to ask the president to apologize to Mr. Khrushchev for fouling up the operation so thoroughly? Well, uh... I wouldn't want to ask him to apologize to anybody for what he did. Uh, I've got a great deal of admiration for him. On it. I think that I get what you're getting at. It's political, and I appreciate it. You're, you're, you've got a keen, sharp mind there, but I've been, I've been imploring my friends across this country in this very, very tragic hour in our history, and I don't think we've ever been in more danger than we are tonight. I'm imploring my Republican friends not to climb on the back of the president. Let's let him operate and uh, confer with the people he must confer with, reason this thing out, work it out, and uh, back him uh, if the country feels he's right. And I think the country's going to feel he's right. Now, Jack and I disagree in politics violently, but we don't disagree one inch on being Americans. He's just as loyal as I am and loves this country. <laughs> 
I, I would not I would not ask any Republican to put this into politics. I've been asking Republicans not to get it into politics. Let's get it worked out. That's the important thing. One more question. <laughs> Senator Goldwater. You say, which is one of your main contentions, that the people can take care of themselves. I should like to ask you to apply this to education. You are, of course, you are, of course opposed to federal aid to education. That's right. It, I have no figures, but it is one of the bitter jokes of one of my high school teachers that he has never paid any federal income tax because of his low income and his several number of children. The situation seems to be very inadequate in relation to how much money is flowing into public education in America. It doesn't matter to me where the money comes from, but you are aware, I'm sure, that school boards, local school authorities, are controlled by the business interests in American communities in general. And the, this, they, they, whether the business interests have the money or not, it is their opinion in general that the school situation is adequate. I think it is far from adequate. And you, you are therefore pushed into the position of accepting the status quo of inadequacy in public education. And in general, I would like to ask you what, what on, by what premise the, the, the business interests can claim to speak for the community in general. Well, sir, on the first place, you're merely, you're merely supposing something that isn't exactly true. Uh, do you suggest that a businessman has no right being interested in the education of his children? I know you don't. On my particular school board, there is one businessman. The rest happen to be working people, and I think they do a darn good job of it. The what I'm, point I'm trying to make out is that nobody has yet furnished the figures to show by figures that the educational efforts of the local school boards and the counties and the states have been inadequate. I admit they've been inadequate in some areas, and there's inadequacy in some areas of my state, but we've taken care of it. If these states who have been, in effect, living off the federal government for the last 30 years will put their house in order and assess at a proper rate, evaluate at a proper rate, they'll have no trouble either. I don't accept your, your thesis at all that education is controlled uh, by the businessman. I think it's, darn, it's a darn good thing that the businessman is interested in Harvard and Yale and Princeton and gives them the money to operate by. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Goldwater, Professor Brocker, members of the panel. I've been, asked to re I've been asked to request that all members of the audience please leave by the exits in the rear of the auditorium. That's the street exits. I should like to announce also that our next program will be the 1st of May. That's this coming Monday. It will feature Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt at Sanders Theater. Thank you.